Hello and welcome to the President's Podcast right here on the record with the Ohio Senate, the views the news excludes. I'm John Fortney, the Director of Communication with the Senate Republican Caucus, the Majority Caucus in the Ohio Senate. It is great to have on the program after a very big week of news concerning State Issue 1, State Senator Michelle Reynolds, a Republican out of Canal Winchester. Representative John Barnes, a former state representative, a Democrat out of Cleveland, Ohio. Rebecca Zatella, who is the past chair of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. And Taji Turner, a Cleveland State University student, who all appeared at a press conference this week in opposition to what we like to call political outcomes over people, the political outcomes over people campaign, otherwise known as state issue one. And when we talk about political outcomes over people, it really does exactly that. We've talked a lot about it, subtracting all the anti-gerrymandering protections that were passed by you, the Ohio voter, in 2015 and 2018, and then adds gerrymandering back into the Constitution based in a foundation of something called proportionality, which is just another word for gerrymandering, and that really does undermine the whole idea of one person, one vote at the expense, particularly of the black voter and the black community. Senator Reynolds? Yeah, so this issue is very, very important to me um, as a black state senator in the state of Ohio, representing the largest urban district in Ohio in Franklin County, fought really hard to be here. And when I learned just what happened in Michigan and how it shrunk our black, well, our legislators um, in the state Senate and uh, the House and also in our congressional districts, they actually had more representation. And then after the independent commission that was supposed to bring more equity and, you know, level the playing field per se, it actually reduced that representation. And to me, that's just unacceptable. So I was compelled to have a press conference and talk about it. State Representative John Barnes, Democrat out of Cleveland. A lot of people know you. You served a long time in the General Assembly, including with the Senate President, Matt Huffman, as well. Um, do you feel that as part of the Black Equity and Redistricting Fund, you've been out there talking about this, along with uh, a former Michigan State Representative and others. Do you feel that issue one, disenfranchises the minority vote. Absolutely, John. Um, the, the whole proposition of moving from one person, one vote, to everyone's counted, to a proportional partisan representation where you roll the dice. You essentially say, they're essentially saying, trust us, we'll, we'll make the right decision. Well, I think that, first of all, it's important to note that everyone I know is against gerrymandering, and I am as well. Um, but issue one is the wrong answer to fix this public policy question. And I, I think that what's going to happen, what we have seen happen in Michigan, is that there has, they have diluted the African American community. Um, this proposition uh, would allow to break up the largest counties in the state of Ohio. Well, where are the largest populations of African American? In the largest counties in the state of Ohio. So if you move outside of, for instance, Franklin County or Cuyahoga County to the neighboring county, you're going to find less minorities. Um, the whole issue is it's not Democratic, it's not Republican. It's identifying the right answer for Ohio, this is a policy question. And it's not as much a political question as it is a policy question because it establishes the methodology by which we move forward. And so uh, in answer, this, this, this will absolutely disenfranchise and dilute the African-American representation in Ohio. Michigan State Representative, former Michigan State Representative Sherry Gay Dignogo was quoted uh, in one of the recent stories of the coverage of one of the news conferences, I believe, uh, in Cleveland. She said they cut Detroit up into 22 pieces. She went on to say, I will never turn my back on the black community and tell them that poison is good for you. This is poison. Issue one is poison because it will diminish and take away 
black leadership. And as she was referring to what happened in Michigan and Re Rebecca Zatella, this had to be a very difficult process just at a foundational level to get a grasp on because you're talking about a very similar proposal that you operated under in Michigan that issue one would bring to Ohio. And in Ohio, it's five Republicans, five Democrats, five independents, basically chosen by what I like to call retired politicians, retired judges who run political races, of course. But you like that, don't you, Absolutely. Representative? Uh -huh. But that's what they are. With the, Judges are politicians, too, yeah, right? They, they are, yeah, they are politicians. And it doesn't take too much of a stretch to think that they would be interested in hiring, in hiring their political friends and political allies, right? But back to the Michigan Commission, I think it took a lot of people's breath away when the representative said they cut Detroit up into 22 pieces. And then the federal three-judge panel said, oh, by the way, your first map was a racial gerrymander because the courts have long held that you don't draw uh, maps based on race. So what was your foundational issue as you came in? I'm sure you had some really good, you know, good ideas and you had some goals that you wanted to meet and you thought this would be a good thing. And then it became a real challenge. Well, we had a lot of challenges <laughs> as a commission. Um, number one was COVID. Um, but the biggest issue was just the way the commission is selected is everybody's a novice. Nobody has any background in redistricting. Nobody has a background in voting rights law. And you have 13, in the case of Michigan, strangers who are trying to figure out how to do a very complex, complicated process with no background experience and no education and how to do it. Who, who was on the commission? You talked a little bit about that during the news conference this week, but who were your fellow commissioners? So, um, First of all, it had to be broken up by demographics. So you had people from certain areas who were chosen based on, you know, you're from the upper part of Michigan or you're from the Metro Detroit area. And then um, it was further based on age. So we had, because of Michigan's population is older, we had quite a few commissioners who were over the age of 60 or 65. Um, and then we had three commissioners who were kind of younger um, in their late 20s, early 30s, and then a couple kind of in the middle 40s and 50s. And so they came from a variety of backgrounds. We had a we had someone who um, was a retired automaker who or automo automotive worker who um, said he was basically a handyman. We had a bank teller. We had two lawyers, myself and another lawyer. We had a uh, payroll person who worked low level payroll at a company. And I mean, someone else who was, in, who was a, ho a homemaker and then was going to school to become an administrative assistant. So pretty wide range of experiences, but not experiences really relevant to redistricting at all. So then who would you, re who would you rely on for your expert redistricting advice? Because you, know, you could see politics creeping into this and maybe not creeping into it because it's hard to take politics out of an inherently political process, but you have to have someone who understands the dynamic of map making. So would you have, for example, the NDRC, the National Democratic Redistricting Commission, the Eric Holder Group, Mark Elias, they've been, you know, suing in Ohio for a long time. How big of a role did a special interest lawyer play side to side in trying to influence or get the maps made? So in terms of ex people coming from kind of the redistricting side, we really only had a voting rights expert. So that was our primary expert. We did have election data services, which was our map drawer that was hired. And they um, have been hired by multiple states to draw maps. However, the commission took the position that they did not want those map drawers guiding us in any way. So they were really there just to, for us to say, hey, can you put this district in with that district? But they couldn't give us any advice. So really, our primary source of advice was our voting rights lawyer and our general counsel. And other than that, we were trying to figure things out on our own. Was proportionality part of your program in Michigan as well? Like it was Ohio? not. It was not. And um, I think it's going to be a real challenge in Ohio if that gets passed. Why should that be so troubling? Well, in order to have proportionality, I can tell you when the Michigan Commission was first formed, we were trained using Ohio as our base because they didn't want us using Michigan maps until we had gone through training. Um, and so we were trained on Ohio. And Ohio has the same setup that I noticed in Michigan, which is Democrats are concentrated in cities. So you have your rural areas and then you have your suburban areas surrounding the urban areas. The urban areas are highly concentrated Democratic. And Ohio is exactly the same. 
we did not have proportionality. We had partisan fairness, and it was ranked criteria four. Proportionality is going to require you to split up the cities in order to meet that requirement. And there just isn't going to be any other way to do it. You're going to have to split them up and stretch them out through the suburbs and into the rural areas in order to meet that requirement. And Taji, before I get to you, I wanted to uh, read a quote from a Michigan State University professor who was quoted, quoted in a Cleveland.com story about this idea of proportionality. And Representative Barnes and Senator Reynolds, feel free to chime in. His uh, name is John Aguia. He, he said this, if Ohio's redistricting measure passes, Aguia continued, there would be an even greater likelihood that this will become a problem. He's referring to the cities being stretched out far past the suburbs. Given the emphasis on drawing a certain number of districts that favor each party, that's proportionality. That requirement would put more pressure on Ohio's redistricting commission to draw more Democratic seats than there are now. Aguia said, raising the chances that they will break up black neighborhoods into separate districts like the Michigan ones challenged in court. It's almost impossible to do proportionality without undermining the minority vote. Absolutely. Sounds like gerrymandering. It is yes. gerrymandering. Would you agree that that's another word for it? Proportionality or fixed outcomes based on per, a fixed percentage is gerrymandering? Yeah, well, I think whenever you're trying to get a particular outcome, that's gerrymandering. <laughs> I mean, really. Well, here, you know, all the, uh, and Taji, you, I have a feeling you have uh, some good perspective on this. It's interesting that when you read the editorial pages in Ohio, they basically say, well, this is a great idea. You know, Ohioans should be in support of issue one. But then there was a Toledo Blade editorial uh, just a couple weeks ago that I pointed out that talked about what the ballot board did with the language, pointing out that it repeals all the anti-gerrymandering protections and adds gerrymandering because of proportionality back into the process. Here's what the Toledo Blade editorial board actually said in their story called Ballot Board Blows It. Quote, we have said that there is an element of gerrymandering in the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment, yet they're still in support of it. I mean, how troubling is that to you? Because you're a college student, you study hard, you were at the news conference this week, and, and to you at a very basic level, when you look at state issue one, what is it to you? It's gerrymandering on steroids. So fundamentally, what we can see happening here is there are a group of politicians who are trying to rig the process because they don't like the outcomes. So in Conflict of Visions by Dr. Thomas Sowell, he writes explicitly about this exact thing where um, if we have a group of individuals who run a race and the same one wins every single time, thousand times out of a thousand, that's totally okay as long as the process is fair. Now, if you cut my leg off, and you expect me to hobble at the same pace, then maybe that's not fair. So um, essentially, to bring it full circle, when we talk about issue one, okay, so you're trying to draw maps to make more Democrats because you don't like the fact that Democrats lose. So again, you're rigging the process to reach a designated outcome. So equal outcomes is something that politicians get into that I think is just fallacious totally, but um, more uh, more simplified than that, the issue that I see on campus is that everybody's saying vote yes, vote yes, vote yes, and then you ask them what is it and they don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Well, it is a complex process, and if you read a 13,000 word, 36 page document, it, you can get lost in the minutia, and maybe purposely so it was written that way. But in Ohio, and Senator Reynolds and Representative Barnes, I like to say that candidates, campaigns, and the issues matter that if you have a good candidate who runs a good campaign and has the financial backing of the party and is right on the issue, they stand a very good chance. And I think voters want to hear people talk about what they believe in. And in Ohio, at least in the Senate, there are 15 Senate districts that uh, lean Democrat. So it's indexed to the Democrat side. Not gerrymandering, that's just called geography. More Democrats live in, in the metropolitan areas, more Republicans seem to live in the more rural areas in Ohio. But of those 15 districts, Republicans have won in eight of those. Should competition, do you think, be part 
of the Ohio political process. Don't you think Ohio's want competitive races? They want to hear from people? Absolutely, John. Um, competitive races is very important. And the reason is that it's reflective of our democracy. You go out and you talk to people. There are some people who are so frustrated um, with outcomes that have not satisfied them that they have uh, considered other strategies that, that, that I call ideological vigilantism. And it's a process where you're taking things in your own hand. You don't care what the outcome. I don't care what happens to government. I don't care that we're not going to have a system that's responsive to people in a way that does not dilute communities, that, um, that, that will function um, within government as, as part of something that, that I can't manipulate. And that's, that's what issue one, I see issue one as a kind of a hijacking of a process. Let's take it, they don't do what we do, what's this what we're gonna do? We're gonna create this. And that, the, the really bad part about it is that there is a demonization of uh, Article II of the Constitution, which covers the, le the legislature. And you're essentially saying, oh, those bums over there, they're no good. They're just making districts for themselves. But you know that there's data out there that would suggest that most people are very happy with the people who are representing them. Why? Because they voted for them. So what issue one would do is essentially eliminate that process and put it in the hands of a group of 15 people who have neither been elected, are not accountable, and have an unlimited American Express to challenge any citizen who challenges the decisions that they make. We don't need that in Ohio. Yeah. And that's why I'm out here on no. Well, they can't be removed except by another commission member, except by a vote of the commission. So you really have a fourth branch. Buddy system. For, yeah, fourth <laughs> branch of government that's totally unaccountable to the voters. And it's very important, too. Uh, here's one thing the issue one campaign doesn't like to talk about. And this might, and feel free to also add on to this, that in September of last year, September of 2023, under the process that 70% of Ohio voters approved in 2015, passed a new set of maps for the General Assembly, House and Senate, with a unanimous, bipartisan vote, maps for the rest of the decade. Now, the people running the Political Outcomes Over People campaign only want to focus on the fact that there was a narrow 4-3 O'Connor majority, I like to call it, that ruled those maps unconstitutional along with the, the congressional maps. But then the U.S. Supreme Court turned around and vacated the ruling and suggested that they should consider using the Constitution on their next opinion. So we have GA maps that are constitutional with a unanimous vote. And the congressional map is constitutional because the U.S. Supreme Court vacated the, the Ohio Supreme Court's narrow 4-3 majority ruling. So we have a process in Ohio that you, not everybody has to love, but there is a panel of elected officials that you can go complain to. Is that important from your perspective? I think that's very important, and I think that's what was missing in Michigan, is that once you're a commissioner, there's 13 of us in Michigan, you can only be removed by a vote of 10 out of 12 commissioners. So it's not just a majority, it's a super, super, super majority. Um, so of course that's never gonna happen. And then the grounds for removal were really limited as well. Um, it's not just you weren't doing your job or you didn't show up, it had to be serious misconduct. Um, and I think what I saw evolve over time with the commission is I think we started out with people with good intentions. And then over time as the crush of people commenting, showing up at our hearings, getting yelled at a lot by people who weren't happy. I think they just started shutting out the public and really cleaved to this concept that we're untouchable, that we don't have to do what the public says, we can't be removed, no one can recall us, no one can elect someone else to go into our position, that we're untouchable and we're gonna do what we want to do. And that was ultimately what I saw happen with the Michigan Commission and it continued to happen up until this year. Our maps got thrown out, we redrew them. And the very last round of map drawing for the Senate map 
we had over and over and over again, people voting for a particular map saying, this is the map we want. This is the map that best represents us across all spectrums, people from Oakland County, Wayne County, Macomb County, you name it. It had broad approval of what everyone wanted it. The commission refused to adopt it. And why do you think that was? Because I drew it. <laughs> I mean, okay. that's why, because it was my map. It was, it was too logical. It was too, well, what I had done is I had taken one of the maps that we had worked on collaboratively and they had ignored communities of interest that we had previously from the first round of public comments said we were gonna include. So they were splitting up Bengali communities. They were splitting up particular neighborhoods that wanted to stay together. There was an Orthodox Jewish community that wanted to stay together that was split. There was a Native American community that wanted to stay together that was split. And I went through and took their map and I reunited all of those communities of interest to, to honor all of those people that had come to us and said, please don't split my community and they refused to adopt it. They just ignored it. They just ignored it, Like yeah. you're talking to the wall. Right. Which gets back to that fourth branch of unaccountable government. You have the executive branch, legislative branch, the judicial branch, and with these panels, you have the redistricting branch that answers to no one. Mm -hmm. One thing, too, I wanted to bring up, and uh, Senator Reynolds and uh, Taji specifically, I wanted you to, re wanted you to react to this. It seems like some of these in their ivory tower editorial boards uh, are just oblivious or there's a cognitive dissonance to what the other side or what the facts really are in Ohio. And this, this shocked me. This was from the Akron Beacon Journal, uh, an editorial written by the former editor of the board. And this was a couple months ago. And I, I just couldn't believe that this is what he said. Quote, Neither have such states found the approach flawless. For instance, Michigan has struggled with getting black representation right. I thought that that was an over overtly racist comment to even suggest that there is a right percentage for the black vote. I always thought that if you had the right candidate, the right campaign, and they were right on the issues, you could win. I mean, do you find that at all offensive, Representative Barnes, for somebody to say that? Absolutely. And um, a, a lot of strategies are out there um, trying to pit the African-American community against its own interests. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I find that amazing. If you, if you look at something and, and it's red, then it's red. Uh, they're telling you it's green. And, and you're supposed to believe that based on what is being said. This, there absolutely is an area of bias uh, with issue one. Uh, just, just for instance, the fact that you want to break up the largest counties in the state. Well, under current law, you can't yeah. do that. Yeah, it's limited so splits. You break up Cuyahoga County, you, you're gonna have a tremendous split. Um, that, that's going to have a devastating impact on the issues that are urban, on the issues, some of which are rural, because what, what your viewers need to understand is that this is not just a diluting of African American um, representation. This also is a disenfranchisement of other Ohioans across the state of Ohio just based on the new methodology that they have of making a determination based on proportional partisan representation. That's unfair, that is un-American, and that should not be happening. That's why people are sneaking around trying to undermine. They're not interested in the right answer. They're, they're interested in their answer that reflects the arrogance of people who feel they have an entitlement to rule and, and hijack our governmental process. You know, Senator, it's not 1964 anymore, it's 2024, and yet we're seeing these schemes put in place simply for partisan political power where you have a competitive district. Mm -hmm. Extremely. You stand on your own two feet. I do. You get out there and you tell them why you think that the you know, tax policy or the fiscal policy or whatever it should be or how we educate children. I mean, how offensive are those kinds of statements to you? Well, I think it's very offensive. You know, when I ran, I ran on results. I ran on a record of results and I've proven myself, which is why I'm elected. I'm elected because people know that 
um, when when you get me, you get a top producer and you get someone that's going to do what they say they're going to do. And I think that's with all candidates. Um, that's how they need to be evaluated. If you have the right candidate, the right campaign and the right resources, then you can win an election. And it should be competitive because we are trusted with the voters vote. Um, but I think in this situation, instead of engaging our votes or engaging voters, they're leveraging they're just leveraging people and it's at the expense. It's just showing that we are expendable because they want a power grab. And so um, what, whatever makes them feel like uh, creating this independent commission, it sounds good. And I'm sure at some level it was in uh, the right spirit and context. However, we're hearing and we're seeing the unintended consequences. And it's a train that is going super fast that we need to stop because it's truly creating a monster. And that's what I want people to take away from this is that, you know, everything that looks good isn't necessarily good. And we really need to be careful what we vote for because we may just get this unintended outcome and consequence that we may not be able to claw back. As a young black man, college student, Taji, what, what goes through your mind when you hear, for instance, Michigan, this is again that quote, for instance, Michigan has struggled with getting black representation right. How does that make you feel? Irritated, because again, um, it's this assumption that we cannot do for ourselves. It's this assumption that black folk are unintelligent voters or you know, there, there has to be some hidden hand to come and do for us. And there's this quote that I love, a fool can put on his own coat better than a wise man can do it for him. And the truth of the matter is that big government is systemic racism. Issue one in Ohio is systemic racism. You're talking about unelected political appointees. They're not public servants and they're doing what they wanna do behind closed doors without regard to how it's actually gonna affect black people. So this, this is sort of paradox where the very people who are sticking their hands out and supposed to be helping us are the very people that are, are hurting us in the end. You talked about, I think you used the word insulated during the news conference, Rebecca, and that's been one of the messages about what Ohio would face with this 15 member panel, because it actually says in the amendment, you can only communicate with the panel during an official meeting of said panel. So if one of the Republicans, Democrats, or independents, you run into them out there on your kid's soccer field, and you go, hey, I really hope that you're gonna keep Canal Winchester together, or I really hope that you're gonna be keeping this part of this Cleveland neighborhood together. You violated the law. I mean, and how worried should people be about the insulated nature? You talked a, a little bit earlier about that, but when you were talking about that during the podcast, but also in the news conference, it was quite chilling that how many people submitted emails or input from the public and were ignored? Thousands, didn't you say? Close to 30,000, yeah. And that was just from the first round. It doesn't include people who commented after our, after our maps were thrown out and had to redraw them. You know, I do want to comment on that quote that you have about Michigan because you know there's really kind of a kernel to it that just irritates me and annoys me because it implies that there was good faith on the part of the commission. We had nine hours of testimony from black Detroiters after we drew our first district maps. Nine hours of people saying, these maps are disenfranchising us, redraw them. We had people submit maps to us saying, use this map instead, this map is better, promote the vote maps. We had a coalition map. The issue was the commission didn't listen. And didn't care to and listen. And didn't care. They were very comfortable with disregarding the views of black voters. And so to sort of imply like we just didn't get it right, we struggled, it's no. We were in our own little shell. We went into a closed session, we talked about it, and we chose to decide how we were gonna dismiss those comments that we were hearing and not honor them. And that was how we ended up in the mess that we were. But it's not that we didn't have input or feedback or solutions or suggestions from black Detroiters, we did. The people on the commission just chose to ignore them and there was really, in their mind, no consequences for doing so. They decide. It's not even just trust us, it's I know what's best for you. Oh. That's it, I know what's best for you. The, right. the condescending attitude. Yeah. Trust oh. us. Right. We have no reason 
to trust to trust any pol I'm speaking as a young black man. We have no reason to trust any government official that is promising things that we know is just unlikely. That you can't primary or defeat at the ballot. We can't line. even get rid of you when you right. get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's like, come on, man. Like, where are we today when the conversation is about what we can't do for ourselves? Exactly, you got it exactly right when you said it's condescending. It's a sort of condescension of the left in general. It's a much broader issue than just issue one, where it's always about what we can do for this group of people instead of getting out of their way and letting them solve their own issues. And I mean, it's not that we don't wanna make things better when they're wrong. We, we just wanna make sure that we get them right when we are trying to improve them. Well, you wanna hear, you wanna have your voice heard regardless of whether you're in the majority vote or the minority vote. You just want to feel like you had input into the process. And Representative Barnes, you've been around the block, you know, in the Ohio General Assembly. I think you were part of the majority and you've been part of the minority at times. Yeah, I, I think that this, this particular initiative has some very dismissive language mm -hmm. as, it, as it pertains to protecting uh, areas of our Constitution as well as the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, the idea is that uh, it's dismissive to the extent that we will do what we can. I, I forgot the exact language, but there, there's, there was some very uh, interesting language that sort of, well, we're supposed to do this and we'll consider, consider. it, but don't expect any outcome um, that, uh, that will go that way. And it's that dismissive. Because proportionality is king. And as we talked about- Proportionality is king. The consideration is what's used in the Michigan Consideration. Amendment. Consideration of communities. Yeah, members. and- We'll, we'll it, consider them. Right, right. <laughs> and and it, well, exactly, that's right, that's right. That's Thanks right. for sharing, but no, we're right. gonna do something else. And uh, Professor- you Right, <laughs> Professor Aguia <laughs> even, yeah, pointed out for Michigan State University that the key difference between Michigan and issue one in Ohio is, competitiveness competitiveness n need not be a consideration. Mm -hmm. So why even bother to have a race? Why even bother to have a campaign? Um, before I let everybody go here, uh, we like to talk about, there's three things that issue one really is. Fixed outcomes because of proportionality, which is really gerrymandering. Zero accountability from an unelected fourth branch of government that will decide the maps. And as we heard what happened in Michigan, 30,000 people came out and testified just, just during the first round and they were basically ignored. And then this is really an attack on democracy, a very well-funded, out-of-state, secretly funded, dark money attack. Some of the money, the majority of the money actually, $6.6 .6 million coming from a fund called the 1630 Fund that was founded by someone who is not a United States citizen. They like to say, follow the money, right? How troubled, Senator Reynolds, should we be about just how this campaign is being funded? It certainly is not an Ohio grassroots effort. It's absolutely not. And, and what I find really disturbing about it is it's not progressive, nor is it conservative. It's just absurd that we are doing this and it's actually coming from out of state. So there's an interest here that is anti-Ohio and it's anti-American. And we just certainly just shouldn't be doing it. And we have to educate this. We have three weeks from today until the election. We have people voting as we speak, as we sit here, there are people standing in line voting and they need to know. And just because we may not have as much money as this out of town, um, investor and power grab that's trying to come into Ohio doesn't mean that we can't speak the truth. And that's what we're here to do. Here's and, some of the, here's some of the John, truth. That, yeah. John, there, there are some equal protection questions um, about the language and about the processes that would be established should issue one pass. So we're going to be in a process of protracted litigation for a long time because they didn't do it right. As I said earlier, everyone's against gerrymandering, but we have to get it right. We don't need this answer or that answer. We need the right answer, and issue one is not it. Oh, no. The 1630 Fund, $6.6 .6 million. The Tides Foundation out of San Francisco, $2 million. Article 4 out of Washington, D.C., 
Three and a half million dollars. Our American future out of Washington, D.C., two and a half million dollars. A lot of out of state special interests, maybe buyer beware, based on your experience in Michigan. What's your message to Ohioans when they go read the ballot language, maybe even read the amendment itself? So I would encourage people to vote no on issue one. I, um, like I said, I, I'm a member of the commission in Michigan. I joined it because I believed in it. But having had the on the ground experience of being on that commission, I do not think it is the right solution for gerrymandering. I think that there are other alternatives that should be looked at. And the last thing Ohio wants to do is bake something like this mistake into their constitution like Michigan has, because it's it's a lot harder to repeal than it is to get it in place. That's right. Missouri so far has been the only state. It was such a disaster in Missouri. Voters in the next cycle repealed it. But that takes a lot of money as well. When you're up against big money, it takes a lot of money to try to change something once it's in the constitution. Taji, what's your message to young voters in Ohio? Read. Keep reading, okay? You see a sign that says it's going to ban gerrymandering with a vote yes. It may not be true. So just go out there and get the information for yourself. State Senator Michelle Reynolds, former state representative John Barnes, Rebecca Zatella, thank you for coming in from Michigan and from Cleveland State University. Taji Turner, thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. If you haven't read it, vote no. Mm -hmm. When in doubt. <laughs> when in right. doubt. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.